Museum of Archaeology of Moscow Tour of the exhibition History of Moscow for Children and Adults Hello everyone, my name is Yekaterina Svetitskaya and I'm curator of the exhibition History of Moscow for Children and Adults. It is my great pleasure to welcome you at the Museum of Moscow, one of the oldest museums in the Russian capital. It was founded in 1896. Let me start telling you about the life of people inhabiting the area of Moscow and Moscow Oblast from the most ancient past. First people appeared in the Moscow area as far back as 27,000 years ago, in the period we call the Paleolithic, which derives from the Greek words paleos, ancient, and lithos, stone, that is, in the Old Stone Age. The most unique, the rarest finds of this period are, of course, bones of various animals as well as tools and weapons of ancient man made of silicon. You now see a huge nucleus piece of flint. Smaller fragments were cut from it to make various tools. In the Paleolithic period, people inhabiting this area hunted in the natural environment similar to our present-day tundra. But 10,000 years ago, the Paleolithic Age was replaced by the Mesolithic period, or the Middle Stone Age. The glacier receded, the weathering climate improved, and people began to hunt using bows and arrows, which is a kind of hunting more familiar to us. They hunted small game mammals and waterfowl. Our collection has some unique arrowheads and darts designed for such hunting. The Stone Age is the longest period in the history of mankind, which ends with the Neolithic period, the New Stone Age. It was during the Neolithic Age that people who lived in this area began to make ceramic pottery, that is, make vessels from burned clay. We can see that these vessels have no flat bottom. Why? because they were dug into the bonfire charcoals. Apparently, early people did not need tables. One of the most unique exhibits of that era in our collection is stone axes with well-preserved, authentic wooden sleeves and handles. It happened because the Voimezhne man site, where these axes were found, had completely submerged on the peat over time and this peat layer prevented the rot and extinction of the organic wooden sleeves and stakes of the dam used by early people for fishing. The next period that follows the Stone Age is called the Bronze Age. Why? Because it was during this period, for this area it is the 3rd, the 2nd millennium BC, that people learned how to work their first metal, copper and make various alloys of copper. These small artifacts are almost all we have in our collection of metal, bronze objects, preserved from that time. A unique, lovely little dagger, maybe even a ritual one, and bracelets, beads, a tiny hook for fishing. This age is also characterized by important migratory processes throughout Eurasia. When people move, they naturally come into some kind of conflict, Wars begin, and these stone-drilled battle axes also tell us about the battles of that time, as they are often found by archaeologists in male burials. Weapons were always put in the warrior's burial, so that when he goes into the world of ancestors, he had something to fight with there. The next metal mastered by man is iron, and the early Iron Age period on this area was in the first millennium BC. It began around the 8th or 9th century BC. People learned how not only smelt iron, but also how to work it, make various tools and weapons, for example, such interesting humpback knives. 
Of course, arrows and shields and battle axes are already made of metal and not of stone as earlier in the Bronze Age. There are also some unusual iron finds. For example, in one of the sites of the early Iron Age, archaeologists have found a hoard of this kind of metal rings. There were a lot of them, more than 20, and similar rings are also found in other early Iron Age settlements. Most likely, it was an analogue of the Zen money. Using the highly valued metal, people could trade, make some commodity money exchange. The people of that time were not only skillful blacksmiths, by the way, we call them the Dyakovs, after their first fortified settlement named the Dyakovo site, which was found where our Kolominska park is now located. So, on the Djakovo site, they found quite a lot of various artifacts and ceramic pottery. The Djakovs were skillful potters and a large number of objects made from the bone. The fact is that metal was valued and they tried to save iron where practicable and make, for example, not fighting but hunting arrows from bones. The people who inhabited the Moscow region in the early Iron Age, our Djakovs, also practiced farming and cattle breeding and, naturally, hunting and fishing. They were already settled, like I said before. They had fortifications, that is, fortified settlements. But scientists don't have any written evidence of that time, so many artifacts still remain puzzles for us to this day. For example, these clay exhibits we call the Dyakovo type weights. Why weights? The first version, when they were just found, was that they served as weights for the loom. But there are many other versions for what these objects of a strange form could be used. For example, I like the version that these are details of a children's toy, a small fir tree. We don't know for sure the ethnicity of the Dyakovs. Most likely, they were the finno ugric and Baltic peoples. Around the 7th or 8th century AD, they leave the area of the Moscow region, and for about 100 to 150 years, a kind of gap is formed when the population of the Moscow area was very scarce. It was only at the turn of the 10th, 11th centuries that Slavic tribes begin to come to these territories. And here is a representative of one of the two tribes that lived in this area, the Vatici tribe. We can see a sculptural reconstruction made based on the bone remains found by archaeologists in the burial of this lovely girl located not far from present-day Zvenigorod. From the Slavs, there remained a large number of burial mounds. The matter is that despite the fact that Rus was baptized, as we remember in 988, its marginal territories remained pagan, and for rather a long time people buried their dead according to the classic pagan Slavic rite, when the deceased were buried with a small burial hill, mound, over them. Naturally, the person who went to the ancestors needed to have not only some jewelry and the objects they used during their lifetime, but also holiday clothes, shoes, and often all this is found by archaeologists in the burial mounds. For example, these beautiful seven-lobed temporal rings, which evidence that this woman belongs to the Vatici tribe. A unique exhibit related to the era of Dmitry Donskoy is this sword of a Druzhina warrior from our museum's archaeological collection. We all know that in 1380, Donskoy gained victory at the Kulikovo field. 1382 was a tragic year for the history of Moscow. The notorious Tohtamish invasion, when Tohtamish burned the entire Russian capital in revenge for the war victories won by the Russians before. In 2004, after another tragic fire, the fire of the Menej building on Menezhne Square, archaeologists were able to carry out archaeological excavations under the Menej. And in a small cache, they found this sword. Most likely, the person who took it from the hands of a Moscow defender hid it, burned it, and a lay of fire, a lay of coal and ash covered the small medieval cache. The weapon was preserved in a unique way. It is the only specimen of a 14th century sword preserved in its entirety, with a blade and a hilt in our collection, and in general, the only one found in the territory of Moscow. 
Small oval silver and copper medieval Russian money, the so-called scales, could be easily hidden in clay pots. And such hoards are often found in the territory of Moscow. But there were also more interesting containers for hiding treasures. Archaeologists find hoards hidden in tiles. There are hoards hidden just in small leather bags. However, the most unusual hoard container was found quite recently, just a few years ago. Archaeologists have found a treasure in a chess piece. Chess was one of the most popular games among adult Muscovites. And archaeologists often find bone or wooden chess pieces. But what did the children play? These were clay toys, wooden horses, human figures. Knuckle bones were very popular not only among children, but also among adults. There was a game comparable to field hockey. A leather ball was stuffed with wool and players kicked it around the field with a stick. There was even skating. This kind of a polished bone was used to make the most primitive skate. Holes were drilled in the bone, it was tied to the shoes and could be used for skating on the ice of a river or lake. Where could one buy toys? Of course, the place was the main Moscow trade row near the Kremlin Wall. In the 14th century, firearms, both guns and arquebus, appeared along with bladed weapons. Here is a firearm used for shooting from the defensive wall. This is a big arquebus called the back or the rear one. Small cannon balls like this were used for shooting from such an arquebus. The armor protecting the warriors was also diverse. Naturally, the classics were chainmail and various shaped helmets with chainmail mesh. Of course, the richer the warrior, the better his gear and his protection from enemy arrows or bullets. We owe the active archaeological research of Slavic burial mounds in the early 1960s in Moscow to the fact that at that time the Khrushchev-era apartment blocks were erected all over the outskirts and districts of Moscow. Fili and Chertanovo, Davidkovo, Cheromushki. It is from these mounds that archaeologists were researching at that time on the sites where these districts arose that most jewelry you can see in our showcase originates. The fact is that organic objects like fabrics or wooden or leather artifacts are very badly preserved in the mounds. The situation is slightly better for metal. That is why all these beautiful temple rings, the jewelry fastened in the temple area, hence the name, ordinary rings and signet rings, bracelets, various torques, grivnas, neck rings, has the name grivna, derived from the old Slavic word for neck, and a variety of beads are better preserved and are more likely to make it into the museum collection. Yet, we do have some truly unique pieces. For example, this pair of male leather ankle boots, also called chobots. They come from a mound at Matveyevskoye and are a really unique artifact. Because these boots are preserved well enough, one a little better, the other a little worse, but still the restorers were able to recreate the whole pair. Please note the flat sole. Leather shoes of that time did not have heels yet. And clearly, we find in the mounds the objects that people used during their lifetime, like tools and weapons. A large number of arrowheads are found in ancient Slavic settlements. But there is one problem. The fact is that we have mainly built up with blocks of flats the territory once inhabited by the Slavs who actually built Moscow.